Can you just get a notification? Yep. It'll, it'll okay. be after the meeting. Okay, there we go. All right. There we go. Okay, so <clears throat> I'll go back up just so the recording can see that. Um, so I wanted to just quickly go through kind of what, how we've gotten here. Recap the uh, Valley Storage recommendation that's going to get further review. And then we wanted one last meeting to really nail down the recommendation for a permit cover. And so the hope is that, you know, have those ready to go to proceed on for more review with more internal and external groups. Um, so we'll talk about what those are. So here's a list of so pretty much all the internal and external stakeholders that have been able to join us. Um, hopefully I got everybody on there. And so the first four meetings were first met when Claire was leading us. Um, he had the meetings in April and June of last year. And then Claire switched uh, departments on us. So we had a bit of a gap. So we kind of picked up and it was almost like a starting over and in some ways just to get refreshers. And so over that time, we really talk, talked about these two um, key topics, valley storage and impervious cover. And those are the two topics that we would like to leave here with recommendations for. So we have advised council um, that by the end of 2024, after meeting with other groups, um, after this, that we will kind of have nailed down and have recommendations for them uh, ready to go. So that is the plan. So just to recap the valley storage. So what valley storage is the area within the floodplain, which is for the most part, right, air um, that only would be filled with water during one of these large storm events. So as you can see on the left, we've got some fill that's reclaiming some piece of floodplain to add additional lots usually for development. Um, and then on the right side, they're compensating that fill or that storage in the floodplain below those um, flood elevations to, to make up for whatever got filled in. So our case study kind of uh, demonstrated what a lot of us, you know, who work in the industry of H, &H engineering that when you fill in floodplain, even if you can make it so in that one spot doesn't increase your water surface elevations, that if you do that throughout the watershed, that it's, it's going to have impacts downstream. So currently, the city of Fort Worth stormwater criteria regulates a one, five, and 100 year uh, storm event. So to sort of stay consistent with the current manual and the way that we do things, um, we would also compensate for the storage in the one, five, and hundred year um, events. So, just to so this slide is the the other the last of those two slides about valley storage. So, so it'd be the one, five, and hundred year storm events. Um, so, where is it? Everywhere that a floodplain delineation is required. So it's not anything weird or small channels or on-site you know stuff we're not looking at that we're looking at natural and sometimes engineered i guess big big channels big conveyance channels and natural floodplain for the most part natural floodplain so it's it's where we're mapping floodplain easements pretty much um so if the floodplain is not mapped even in a approximate manner then this would not apply so, so usually when it's mapped in an approximate manner, um, if someone's coming in to plat, they're going to do a detail understanding of that. And so that's where this would apply. They would also, so there are people are, uh, everyone's already submitting. I'm sorry, so I'm going to do it for clarity. So above or in the approximate zone A, you know, or love friend zone A. You know. 
uh, above that, this would not apply, right? Okay. Right. Where where they're taking it to? What so some Yeah. So so I took out the sixty four acres, but we're going to probably revisit that at some point. But currently, if there is a zone A, we are asking folks to either extend that up through the edge of their property, or until it's underground, or until they hit a sixty four acre drainage area general stopping point. And Wait, so you are applying it above zone A? Absolutely. But only so, when so it's being extended. Just, that's not what you just told me. Yeah, just to clarify, on the new detailed studies, the ordinance requires that you extend it. To, uh, so it would be, but not beyond that. If that's what, so your, the answer to your original question is not beyond the mapped area. Okay. New development. So uh, my, uh, and, and that's my point. Is what? Where's the clear definition of where this apply and where it doesn't? I think that everywhere that a floodplain delineation is required. Okay. Well, oh no, the floodplain, which is not someday because you have to go even above someday. You have to extend your study up through the course of your property. Right. And delineate. And delineate. delineating it. Right. So sometimes it's not delineated yet until. Understand. Right. So you say it will extend. It's not where current zone A is mapped. No, it exists no, above that. It does. Okay. It does. And it's that, typically that needs to be clear because that's not. Yeah, it's typically pretty close. So right now it's that 64 acre mark. Um, or the. What if you have no zone A on your property, but you still just have to run? Obviously, you would have to run the hydraulics on an unmapped channel. Is it going to apply there? No. So if you're not, if it's you've got no floodplain mapping going on. Whether it's floodplain easement or FEMA, then it would not apply there. Okay. Okay. Even though you still, you know, minor trip, you still need to know what your water service yeah. elevations and, are, and then and really that's the basis for your storm drainage design as you extend it yeah. to the subdivision. Yeah. So, but it would not apply if and you I don't think, have any mapped floodplain on your property. And these are good questions because these are things that, and I know, like Dak was, we want clarity. That's we don't want interpretation by one reviewer and mm -hmm. another reviewer thinks it's a good update here like when does it yes happen? where exactly yeah that, and that's 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 what i'm just trying to get no, that's good. Good. Where, 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 where it's not and and i did have the 64 acre and then in the last presentation i'm like i'm gonna take it out that's <laughs> so, yeah, that's pretty small and that's a lot of work for a lot of, you know what i mean and i would just also challenge the burger because you said originally um the where we're going to have a floodplain easement and so sometimes we put a footplain in right. an area like you just said. Right. Sometimes, we don't. So, sometimes but and, it's a drainage easement. And sometimes we did put floodplain easement in the ETJ, right. and sometimes we yeah. don't. So. Right. But even so, if it has no mapped floodplain on the property, it, it clearly does not apply. If it's not mapped right. or going to be mapped with that project or plan, right? That's you mapped like sent to FEMA mapped? So maybe we need to talk about what on. the floodplain one that currently says and how it currently is applied. Yeah, yeah. So that's going to be. Maybe, maybe we need to talk about how the floodplain one is currently applied so that we've got that context because we're basically saying we're going to do it that same way. But maybe we need to talk about how, <laughs> how that works today. Yeah. Would that help? Well, well I think I do understand but I mean, yeah you're going to map a floodplain easement or a drainage easement through your property whether there's any mapped floodplain there or not anytime an injured one of the engineers does a floodplain study right and that's my question is if there's no zone on the property are we going to have to analyze valley storage for that project so if we jump in for a second sure but it sounds like <clears throat> if you've got a hundred acre project then somewhere in that you're probably exceeding the 64 acre threshold or one tenth of the square mile. But the 64 acre threshold is not in there. It's not. Well, that's easy. so where it's required, it is required at 64 acres currently. If that changes. Okay, that's in the current ordinance. That is in the current right. ordinance. But you're saying, but again, it's one thing to do what we do today mm -hmm. to go through the valley storage analysis is. An additional step, and that's why I'm asking where does this apply and where does this not apply? If it stops where zone A applies, that's very clear. If it's what I'm understanding you to say, anytime I have to do that, basically every project has to comply, regardless of size, if you have to do a 
mapping kind of drains you to the flood plain. Is that is that what I'm understanding you're saying? So the current ordinance tells us that we're supposed to eventually map FEMA floodplain up to a point where the watershed is 64 acres or more. And so we're saying to that same extent is where we've used you know, the modeling that's already been done to determine the valley storage pre and post mm -hmm. and apply that regulation. And so the, the extent of that regulation for valley storage would be the same as the extent of where we would require FEMA plot plan to be mapped. Okay. Which is not any property with zoning on it today. Right. That's a totally different definition. So we're, right. we're looking at a map, you might have you know your storm drains picking up 20 acres, and then maybe another channel picking up you know 20 to 64 acres. And then once you hit that 64 acre point, now it's in a plot plane, mm -hmm. and in that same area, you start looking at valley storage. Okay. I wish I had a whiteboard mine. <laughs> no, I, 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 no, I understand. I, that's clear, Stephen, what you're saying. I'm okay. just saying that's not. That's not what you're hearing. No, or seeing right. on the screen. that is not. I, so I maybe mean, a half a mile away from my property, but I still have to go through that process under city regulations. And you said you're going to apply the valley storage requirement to that pro project. Okay, that's a, that's a very different criteria on what it applies and what doesn't. So it's, it's, uh, I, if, if I'm misunderstanding that. Lots of people. I just think it needs to be distinctly yeah. clear. So I think what this what needs to be the details need to be worked out. Definitely. Um, but it sounds like we're not asking developers to go and study further than what they would already have to do to define yeah. the floodplain. Is that? I think it's the intent, at least from what we've been talking about, is anywhere that is or will be mapped but as new floodplain. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm I'm not interpreting that. I'm just but again. The valley storage requirement is an additional requirement, not required by FEMA, not required by anyone else. That's right. basically self-imposed by the city. I'm just trying to understand where where that oh, is. Definitely, on. yeah, yeah. Definitely. yeah. And because you're right. Like sm the smaller channels do run the line five and hundred year under those thresholds, mm -hmm. right? And so we're not asking for that. So and this will get we'll go through with that. We're gonna you know probably. Go with the uh, talk to the inter intercontinental uh, meeting, and that's where these types of holes can get yeah. further poked uh, to to get these uh, details. And and we do want to I'm jumping ahead, but I want to send out a memo, kind of spelling out you know this this recommendation and and where it's coming. Um, after we're done, so you all can have a look and go. This doesn't make sense, or we didn't talk about that, something like that. So, just getting back to this, you know, we would we would use the floodplain ordinance, um, revise that to include. So I guess the intent is that we're trying to keep as much the same as we can, and I kind of go off the left field. So update the criteria, stormwater criteria manual, and then. You know, have DAC and others review it before we ever get this presented to council, so everyone's on the same page and there isn't any uh, confusion. So, and, and I'm just thinking, you probably, what are you going to do when, let's say, you just have like a county road, you know, Keller or Kicks Road somewhere? That's the existing county road. You're going to improve it to City Street, mm -hmm. and as part of that, you've got a creek cross it. You better put in a multiple box culvert and whatever else. There is some loss of valley storage. Right? Are you going to require that project by itself to also comply with the valley storage so that's mitigation what, requirements? Yeah, or we've or talked, do you exempt those? Right. We've those talked about that. Um, we looked at few some of the other cities we've done benchmark on this. Frisco, for example, they do exempt those. Um, Grand Prairie doesn't. Does, <laughs> okay, so Grand Prairie does not. But I would suggest it make the city a lot easier. And a developer, if a developer's building <coughs> off-site road or something like that, you know, from my standpoint, and the city's coming, probably doing more of that with city projects than developers in that group will be. But it's something yeah. to, to yeah. consider that's, whether you want to go to that level of detail or not. But that's then you have to go. Off, you're you're looking offside and drainage easements off the out of the street right away to mitigate it. Yeah. 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 Big camera. So I think that would benefit everybody if you did the exempt out somehow. 
Lisa, did you want to? Yeah, I was going to add, we're, we've talked about looking at how we do exemptions like in, in the CDC program. So we do valley storage along the Trinity River already with that CDC program. And so we've talked about, let's look at, you know, for those kinds of projects where we know it's just going to be too hard uh, to mitigate that. And it is something that needs to be done along a, a road or a bridge or something like that. Uh, CDC already allows exemptions. And so we were thinking we would kind of follow that lead and that way it's consistent throughout all the programs. So, and it makes it easier for everybody to understand what is allowed, what isn't allowed, what can be exempted. So I'm sorry, I'm not there today, y'all. So luckily we can do this virtual. Can you still hear me? Sorry, y'all yes, got, yes. okay. Everybody got quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I had to turn up the speaker there, Lisa. So we can't, couldn't hear you that well. Oh, you can hear me that well? We could, we could hear you. Yeah, it was just a little quiet. Okay, I'll try to speak up next time. So, one more thing for you. So, is, are the measures cumulative to where a lot of times we don't want both sides of the creek? And you're not going to ask me to do a cross section and like that. You're taking up some balance short on this side and not giving it. We're putting it back on this side. If I can do it on an entire stretch of the property that we own, where I'm maybe taking some here, but I'm getting some back there, is there can I balance it within our own reach on our side of the creek? Larissa brought up that same question, and I think those are the types of details that we want to. It's going to be more challenging with the riparian role coming in too. So. We'll have to think through that process. Being discussed. Yes, exactly. Not coming in. Yeah, sorry. Being discussed. So I'm glad you're here today. Yeah, Good. that's a that's a great point. Mm -hmm. And I'm yeah, we haven't gotten that far into it quite yet. <laughs> but yeah, is it, is it through the, throughout the property? Yeah. Is it you know, you know? I think you mentioned other cities had you doing it cross section by cross section, and you're having to balance it at each cross section or yeah. between each. That, I think that's unreasonable. Yes. And it's frankly that's not the step. You're not looking for that science. You're looking for valley storage. You're not looking for conveyance. You dealt with conveyance in your hydro drawing draw, models. Draw, yeah. draw models. So, so conveyance is settled. It's valley storage is just another requirement. But as long as you have an area, you can create a you know excess valley storage in one area that's low impact. You, I would encourage the city to look at allowing developers to do that, not look, not worry about the cross section, the cross section thing because that's not it's storage it's not conveyance yeah. so why do you care i mean when you build a lake if you build it off this way or if you build it off that way you know i mean you're, how, how you extend the main body of it whatever else it doesn't matter the volume is the volume right? yeah the shape yeah. of the lake doesn't matter and it could depend on the length of the reach and what's you know what types of uh, Infrastructure is between, you know, if you've got three road crossings, maybe it doesn't matter cumulatively, or maybe it doesn't. So I think those are things that we definitely like input from. Yeah. Um, but it sounds like the group would would prefer a larger cumulative storage. Yeah. You know, cumulative within the project. Right. Of right. right. At least give you some more flexibility. Plus, I mean, you talked about the riparian initiative and within the just tree ordinance stuff. Like right. A lot of protected trees happen to be in areas where floodplains are. Well, yeah. are we going to give any kind of, if we need to mitigate for valley storage, do we get some kind of consideration that we may have to take out some trees in order to do that and not get dinged under the tree ordinance or under the riparian initiative? We're, yeah, we're kind of coming at it from opposite. You know, this is cut and fill. This is basically, you know, so this is the opposite of, of saving natural habitat and saving riparian areas and saving trees. So I, I, it could be. I don't want it to be where the city enacts multiple regulations or ordinances or whatever else now. And, and they're all competing. In, and, and guess what? It's the developer's job to go fix it and solve it. Now we have kind of competing masters. So I, I'm going to suggest the city policy-wise needs to decide what's their greater hierarchy for you, and it could the be valley that. storage or the trees. You know, get, give it, give us some a combination of one place or the other to tell us which way is more important to you. Right, right. and, and it could be course. that you don't, you don't need to compensate because you're not filling it. Right? That's the other option. Actually, but there are places. 
where you, you, you do want to, and, and it's totally appropriate to do. Right. And basically what you're doing is if, if you do, if these ordinance could basically, you can't do that anymore. So you just took a piece of property and you had essentially developable land and now it's no longer developable. So the city is basically reduced the value of that property and increased the end of the day, you know, you get fear houses, you know, fear houses on the market. Mm -hmm. Right where are the day where we can't put enough houses on the ground to satisfy demand, or we drop up the price. That's true. And, so, and one one other thing, you know, I guess what I I'm I'm in personally in favor of the keep more cumulative. I guess so long as it doesn't become like a you know wetland bank where it's like oh yeah we're gonna do it way over here. Hydrology doesn't work that way, so causing an increase, but it's okay because we put some down storage where. Yeah, it doesn't matter. So, anyways, uh, well, Valley Storage, Valley Storage doesn't care where it is. They're looking at a hydraulic standpoint. Right. I mean, that's why it needs to be analyzed. Right. I understand. I know what you're saying. That's right. what, I guess that's all I'm saying. Yeah. So, so, this is the, the general recommendation. We want to preserve Valley Storage. We already do the 1500, and we're not trying to extend it beyond some. You know where we're already not studying and uh, and mapping natural natural floodplains. I guess is kind of what I would look at. So okay, so that's I'll per, I'll document this and write it up and include that in a memo, and then we can further get in the weeds. Um, and I'd love any feedback y'all have on these types of, of things that we're talking about now. Preferences. Um, so the that was supposed to be the, the low hanging fruit, and, uh, <laughs> and then the one that's been like the last three meetings and this <clears throat> one is, is impervious cover. And it's more complicated, it's more complex, and it's more difficult if we're you know, get right down to what do you do? So kind of just to recap what we've talked about, we have. <laughs> We had the zoning folks in here last time. They weren't able to come. Uh, but Stephen Murray was in here and doing benchmarking. Some cities, some cities talk about impervious cover in their zoning ordinance. Uh, most do not, um, including Fort Worth. So we describe with zoning a, a lot coverage um, for different zoning types, and that pretty closely lines up with surfaces that are impervious on a lot but it's it's not exactly that and so you can kind of see on the left you know what lot coverage does include and then what it doesn't include sheds arbors any overhang that's you know outside of the foundation of the building um, pools uncovered anything uncovered patios so that's that's kind of just where we're at those are the differences between impervious cover and lot coverage so we'll get into what that means and what what would we want to recommend to do differently so just a quick recap pretty intuitive but as you lose your uh, natural ground cover and you get more impervious services that leads to more volume and higher peak flows and generally you know with current design standards we try to capture within reason most of that either underground or within the right-of-way um, on the surface and uh, unfortunately a lot of the older areas in Fort Worth mostly inside the loop are cannot contain that within the right-of-way and it leads to flooding um, in several areas so what what could we do we, we don't regulate lots less than one acre for stormwater at all we're seeing a lot of uh, redevelopment infill development so what little ground cover is left is being replaced with you know townhomes things with bigger footprints and you know city is fully in favor of um, this redevelopment and we've got a current uh, infill ordinance going through and it's not just the urban areas but there are more there is more stormwater volume um, in some of these suburban residential subdivisions so just want to include that um, 
We typically try to retain, right, the peak flows or mitigate those with a dry detention pond <laughs> is usually the, the answer here in Texas. Um, but there are other ways to mm -hmm. mitigate that. Um, but there are, you know, the real everyday storm, the low high frequency, you know, the low storm event, high frequency, everyday, that, that just kind of passes on by. So um, this, this is a uh, Randall Mill that you see at the top and that creek currently crosses under Randall Mill a couple times and they're, they're doing a road project where we're elevating and turning those two crossings into one crossing. But anyways, We've talked to some of the folks out there and they're they're seeing development upstream and they're not they're not saying it floods more but they're saying they're seeing a lot more water coming through and so they're right right there's there is more water coming through because there's more water being generated from the development upstream so just wanted to point that out um does that mean we do anything about it that's kind of up to us as a group so i want to walk through i can't We've gone through a lot of different, I guess, potential recommendations, and I wanted to walk through four specific recommendations that I felt that we talked with as a group and meeting with zoning um, after our last meeting. So I'm like, either this is a realistic solution or recommendation that we want to proceed with, or we want to just put that fed forever and stop talking about it. Uh, so, so of those four, Last time we talked, um, the group said, we don't think there's just one you know, solution. We need multiple you know, things. Could, so multiple recommendations. So of the four, I'm hoping to get y'all's input, which, which goes forward as a recommendation, um, and which doesn't, or should we modify something? So the first was, um, we had a couple case studies done at the very beginning of this that Claire asked um, a consultant to look at one of these very urbanized areas and they found what you see on the left is our current stormwater criteria manual with, with percent and purviews for different zoning types. Um, they found on several of the zoning types that they were trying to simulate in their model were not included in that table. And so they were kind of balancing ideas off of us, you know, what should we use here, what should we use there. And so they came up with this other table of, you know, zoning classes that were not included uh, in our current criteria manual. So the idea would be, and after talking with development services, uh, Leon's not able to be here today, but, you know, we feel like that's a pretty easy ask is to just incorporate those into the current manual. Um, not only that, but some of those percent impervious um, numbers they they were generated using certain assumptions based on zoning and so i think it'd be good to just revisit those assumptions um, so that's the very that's a blown up thing um, of that very bottom part of table 3.5 so just revisit some of those assumptions and make sure we're still in agreement do we need to bump any of those up um, do they look okay? Do we need to incorporate some of those other zoning types and kind of adjust adjust our numbers, or are you know, or is it fine as it is? Um, what do y'all? How do y'all feel about that first first recommendation? So the recommendation would be update the manual. Well, what are the old and what are the new? What are the, the older on the left? So the newer. Okay. So the newer on the right. So we've got urban residential. A couple of the MUs, some very specific ones, Cambui, and then general, there's like different levels of commercial. So I think most of that people just make assumptions, but sometimes, you know, engineers are making their own assumptions, and then there's some back and forth with the reviewers that y'all don't like to do. And yeah, the bottom line is your current zoning classifications do not match your design manuals for stormwater. Right, so just continue to add, add zoning classifications based on different markets and land uses. And so it's just we don't always update the stormwater side of things accordingly. So it's just try and line those up accordingly. So instead of just having all commercial under one deal, you have several levels of commercial on the zoning classification. Yep, that's so, it. So Ben, you're it, looking at this then trying to understand on the left yeah. table is there's all sorts of um, 
zone zone A classifications at the top, a little hard to see. It'll yes. Over here. Yeah, it's it's just, a single family. And then there's some commercial and some parks and things at the bottom, and those range from mm -hmm. what, like 35, 40, 60, 70, up to 100% on that table on the left. And then the classes on the right are not explicitly, I'm, I'm kind of asking for clarity. The ones on the right are not explicitly listed in the table on the left, That's it. but they're sort of kind of coming up to be a recommendation. What do right. we think about? So, so it they're would all be, 90, 95 on yeah. the right. So so the idea would be this engineer came up with those numbers already. It's mm -hmm. in our report. So the recommendation would be let's incorporate those uh, and maybe some additional ones. Mm -hmm. So when a study is being done, nobody's having to guess, well, it's commercial, but it doesn't look like that commercial. And it's, you know, which commercial are Do you know which ones you're having the most trouble with? So I'm just curious. I don't know that there's trouble in Okay. You know, I mean, like, mm -hmm. I don't know how, if there's that much confusion. So I think yeah. it's just an easy, like, let's just add this in. And, it, and, and I think well, they're. So you're willing to take the work that they did and basically change the entire city of design criteria based on that? Well, update the table with the additional. Which is changing the city design criteria, right? Yeah, right. It is. I mean, it's a it's a city accepted study. Do, do you see any issues with those? Well, I mean, they all went up. I mean, and, and I guess my question is, is in general, we started out with the problems that the city's having, and they're all urban inside the little problems. And I thought we had a discussion about that back there. Why don't we focus on where we have the problems and fix the problems? And this, I mean, are we going to restudy all of our design criteria for new suburban development or just change the speed factors in a vacuum? Uh, and, and let me and, ask and, to support, let me to follow on what you're asking. I'm trying to understand between the left table and the right table is the idea that that would now cover all the city like he's asking or or take take an example a house down the street a single family zone a is that already covered somewhere in the table on the left or is that now in one of the new categories on the right i'm trying to kind of walk through it like how if i was building something how would it apply to me sure sure so so the ones on the right just aren't explicitly stated as zoning classes in the current manual, <clears throat> which is on the left. Can you just make a table that equals that and call it good? <laughs> so I'm just saying, right. is, it, is it? It would just be a bigger you know, table, really. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, if you don't have a site plan, then you use a commercial 4% open space 96, which is higher than all these numbers over here. Um, so I'm just kind of confused, I guess, on what you're asking yeah. there. Yeah, Mike, what do, you, what do you think? So from the SDS review standpoint, we do see a lot where they are using a particular multifamily, say, for example, because they're low, medium, and high. Mm -hmm. And it, it might come in somewhere between medium and high, and they pick medium. And we go look at dwelling unit, dwellings per unit, or whatever that number is, in the table. And it, it's actually in it's, it's more than medium and so we would make a comment for that and so some of this is taking away the gray areas mm -hmm. uh, and some of it is also um, looking at real use so real use this number for a5 that's on here 69 percent or 65 percent is the percent impervious that's on the table and Ben's got a couple of pictures here that show you what could be done if you go to that photo Ben sorry to speed you ahead a little bit no, so, so on the left is what we used in 2004 or 5 to come up and calculate and there's a little diagram where we calculated 65 percent on the right side, and you see all the parking lot, backyards completely paved, 100%. Is that 65% impervious? No, that's about 90% impervious. So if everybody continues to develop like this, and this is what we're calling our TCU microdorms area, but it's happening in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. If that continues, 
we will exacerbate flooding in the entire watershed. Understand. And so updating this table, not just now, adding these other classifications to it, but periodically keep coming back to it, and updating the table can help us in the stormwater development services review side of things, identify when we're going to outdo our storm drain system or cause a home to flood that better. Was there a rezoning for those people? No. So they're in the A5 zone. Well, I don't know what they are. That's right. so but they're very, they're I'm assuming because they're not being replied as very TCU. I, I understand exactly the problem you're having. You have some problems over in the Linwood. You know, I'll get Linwood and stuff like that with all the new places and things like that. Again, and the city's on this whole path of maybe we need a different sort of criteria far in city development that the Greenfield ordinances that the city has aren't really adapted for inner city redevelopment and come up with a separate code for that. The same way, this is an inner city problem. This is not the problem you have north of 820 in the, you know, in the hundreds of subdivisions and the thousands and thousands of homes that are up there it's not a it's it, it, it that picture doesn't look like that up there right now Brandon I know it's you know people do stuff but it's so that's why I'm saying you have a different problem inside the city inside the loop I guess I should say more in the inner city and why should we why shouldn't you look at them separately and have a separate criteria there where you have a different problem than you do in suburban greenfield new development and, and and that entire subdivision by the way is all developed to your new comprehensive drainage criteria those neighborhoods inside the city the streets the neighborhoods whatever you know they're, they're likely zero detention you know i mean if i'm a new developer and i'm on a greenfield tract inside the loop and i want to come in and say hey you know i'm going to design my entire subdivision to new city criteria and i can do that then you don't have that inner city problem necessarily. That's most of these places you do, and it's exacerbated by the fact they're very old design, you know, 50, 60, 80 year old infrastructure. So, so I, I'm just suggesting don't, you know, don't lump it all together because it's it's really different. And and you know, you see a different set of problems. I know you know about the for you guys over here for the issues you have to deal with. I understand that. So I just. I want to make sure I'm hearing you correctly, Art. So it sounds like you're saying in maybe like within the loop or some of these older areas that we could have different impervious percentages than outside the loop. I would suggest so because that's what you see, right? Redevelopment versus development almost. Because there are some open spaces that have been developed inside the loop as well. Mm -hmm. We may want to put a neighborhood in to the fall right. the new criteria. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't disagree there's issues, and I don't necessarily disagree with percentages, maybe there's some revenue, like you want to think all the industrial is 95% impervious cover. We're off the bat, we have a chain, so that's 10% of, of the property that's set aside for detention, plus your tree islands and your front yards and stuff. And so maybe 95 is the right number there for some of those uses. In, in terms of clarity as well, let me just ask an exercise. <laughs> on the table on the right, it says CB Camp Rui. What is What is that referring to? A form businesses code. the street no that's a that's a form code for camp Bowie, but i don't i don't see tcu barry i don't see near south side right this was based area. on one specific case study in one okay. specific area of the city mm -hmm. so they looked at actual percent impervious on actual lots and came up with actual percent impervious for real places so they didn't make this up there wasn't engineering judgment these were based on actual percent impervious cover. So I guess the question I'd have is does percent impervious on my industrial change inside the loop and outside the loop in your minds? No, it change. I just think that the effects of what you're saying and what's caused this conversation to begin with was the flooding that's happening in our central city and urban core areas that we have the many woods and the TCU areas. I don't think we necessarily have these issues. And I could be wrong, maybe. Yeah, are we confident that we want in the future? Water. Like, we don't adjust because what they found was that our design criteria underestimated volume and flow compared to the design criteria. So, I guess the question is if we continue on status quo, will we have problems in the future? 
Um, and yeah. so we don't have problems in that at all. Mm -hmm. Are we confident of that? I don't know. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm slow. I'm still a little lost. I don't understand what Canterbury means. Is it buildings? Is it streets? Is it parks? And then there's another one on there that says um, General Commercial F. Well, is that not already on the table on the left? There's a category over there that says commercial on the left. So I see two different percentages and I'm starting to wonder how do I know which one applies? Is there any overlap or are these two tables mutually exclusive right now? Well, right now, this is just in us on the right. One on the right just comes out of a study that we had done. Okay. So they but if take we combine them, them now, yeah. they're mixed. And yeah. So we'd have we'd have to right. We wouldn't just you know copy and paste. Okay. We'd have to definitely. Uh, okay. So mm -hmm. rather than just having commercial, probably break it down into different okay. types. Of and, yeah, and but there's an overlay district. Yeah, so, yeah. Know, that's what they're talking exactly. about. Exactly. But I'm I'm thinking that some of the other zoning over here might already apply to some of those structures yes. and the overlay. Yeah, yeah, right. I think mean, you're right. That's what I mean, I'm you're right. Some of the more specific ones like TCU right. or yeah, they, so they may not be appropriate to try like the last squeeze discussion. that in there. We need to eliminate any opportunities for misunderstand misinterpretations or multiple interpretations, yeah. right? At some point. And I, I like the idea on the conversation of maybe different types of land use you maybe need different percentages. It just depends. And maybe kind of take a look. So just one size fit all. I don't know. Yeah. That might I mean I know it complicates it a little bit, but yeah. they might be no, I, I, I agree that it, you know certain um, residential definitely is different things. Right. And, and and you're right. Look, but if you look at the the, the current Inter, you know, or central city neighborhoods, you know, that we're having the issues with redevelopment. How many of those neighborhoods, how many were they built 100 years ago, 80 years ago? You know, most of them, they're not 40 year old neighborhoods, they're twice that old. Mm -hmm. And 80 years from now, we may need to do something suburban too. But that's like saying, I want to put a commercial track up near Alliance Airport. And treating it the same way you do the central business district. It may be a central business district 20 years from now, but or 80 years from now, but it's not now. So same way with the inner city residential development. Those are all driven by something. A lot of it's just the desire to live in the inner city and, or the central city. And, and you know, people are a lot of people want to spend extra money and live in the city, but all, all the multifamily, you know, the, the, well, you know, that all into heights where you had a lot of people building duplex for two years when they had. A lot of our own times was covered by the zoning and people are doing it by right. And then all the TCU stuff. And I mean, I get all those problems, but I, I, I do contend that, that that's a different development than what you see in a new subdivision in, in a Greenfield development. And I just strongly feel I mean, if you recognize it from the other side, like inner city needs its own code because the Greenfield code for new development is not really wasn't really written for redevelopment and, and it, it makes total sense for the city to change that and be to create a code that's adaptable i just think this is the same thing should be part of that well, does does the green field development um, does that contemplate the concerns that are being addressed from an impervious cover when y'all do your studies on that uh, so you can build to that because well i mean it, it it doesn't contemplate everybody builds a swimming pool or everybody yeah, has this. Right. Not everybody will, whatever. I mean, uh, but but some will, so it's kind of a mixed bag in there. But again, all all these are all based on engineering science that City of Fort didn't create from mm -hmm. scratch. This is all accepted engineering science that is used across the country and it's adaptable by right. by your climate. Obviously, you have more rainfall in Charleston, South Carolina than you do in Phoenix. You know, so the rainfall data varies based on your, your actual locations but uh, i mean it, i've never seen it anywhere micromanaged down to the point where this is he's gonna this, this guy's gonna put a patio in his backyard so yeah it's a different criteria those the criteria are, are meant to deal with some of those problems you know the, those yeah, issues yeah. that there's going to be some people that put in you know patios and things like that but overall you designed this entire subdivision with all new current city criteria it wasn't designed on criteria 50 years ago that estimated half the runoff that's actually there today. Right. And that's that's the difference. Is the entire subdivision is designed that way. The streets are wide enough to contain the hundred year within the right away. You got a detention pond so that you know 
anything that leaves the subdivision is is detained so that the volume or the, the rate of water going downstream is not any higher, it's more volume, but you slow it down. So you have a, 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 an entire subdivision and drainage system built on current today's criteria. Gotcha. It's a total different thing than when you go in, in town and yeah, you can redo the block of homes and put in a bunch of duplexes or whatever you like to do. But those storm drain inlets and the storm drain pipes in the streets, they were based on criteria from 50 or 80 years ago. And yeah. it's, it's, you know, very okay you get to do what you do on the lot but you can't fix it unless you just rip up everything and start over and that's why we get arlington heights and Wynwood and tcu and all these areas that have flooding problems that's well but i kind of go back to your point you know i live here in the city yeah so i'm i'm more concerned about all the redevelopment and i'm thinking right. there is i mean everything's in purview's cover now practically it can't be and, and so you know the recommendations differentiate between the redevelopment in some of these areas that we know are flood problems and say okay i mean you're going to have to do some restrictions or build in regulations or requirements that we've got to provide for more opportunity for water to escape and go into you know valley storage area or whatever but yeah so i think the idea here would just be to try to make sure those percent impervious numbers closely matched to what it's actually gets built out there. I think that's so is the is the is your focus residential? Because everything on the list on the right is sort of fits in that more commercial industrial box. Yeah. It almost like it almost makes sense that maybe those land use types fall within an expanded definition of the commercial industrial um, definition we already have. And yeah. that those uh Yeah, those are broken percentages. down pretty fine. So I think that's kind of the next step. Yeah. Kind of what you guys are saying is maybe a lump them somewhat. Mm -hmm. And then I think what I was getting at with the uh, assumptions is that does that does um, relate to residential also. So it's like with that 63% are, are we, right. that's how that that's for that's, that's for red, I mean, for red that's that's they use wider streets or did they, I mean, yes, they're for such streets. Okay. So <clears throat> to get back to the, my own question was that you say they studied actual areas but but you, your samples can obviously sway your data mm -hmm. and I'm just saying did he study in town and suburban you know Greenfield I mean what where did they study that did they and did they study it going in with the idea that this might end up in a city design criteria manual and did, was it done to that level of detail that, that was only my question yeah is, yeah is how it was you know, that was definitely not there. Was this something somebody did in a week, or is this somebody that spent months on? You know, and, and yeah, it was very confident. Over about a year, or so okay. um, okay. it was a lot. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of work. So, but that that wasn't really their intent. Their intent was just, hey, we want to let you guys know. Okay. We had to make a bunch of judgment, and they came to us when we did. But they said we don't know what exactly to do here because nothing in your manual fits this spot. So what do you think? And so right. when we talk, I, and I get all the other categories. I understand so, that. So that's that. kind of where that came from. So if they're confused on doing one area, surely other folks are confused, you know, and having to make yeah. judgments. And then they're going right. back and forth with the SDS reviewers, and it can be a little different every project, right? Right. What the outcome of that is. So. Right. But you were to address your redevelopment stuff. Yeah. They have to look at that no matter what happens now, especially in the city flood risk areas. No matter what size project you're looking at, the storm water. It's still coming really, really, really soon. Huh? It's still coming very, very soon. We're going to assume for a while. But if I go build a lot, then yeah. We're having to study everything in Linwood to make sure I'm not making the project. Right, and, and it is and it is tricky. Um, it is tricky. And the bottom line for today is it's nothing to do with the land use, it's nothing to do with the infrastructure. The right. The ground, that's yeah. To and and, and for, yeah, for the most part, what's most impact in these areas is there's already water coming down the street. How do you avoid not getting flooded and building the city? So that's the whole. In my opinion. And you know, building a property a foot higher doesn't solve any of the problems. Yeah. It just makes it <coughs> you allow the development to happen anyway. You just go, oh, it's going to my property. Is it? Yeah. So, Mark, the question around purpose covers more around do we need to reevaluate any of the numbers to make sure we don't have the same situation 50 years from now? 
what we've got in the neighborhood with undersized infrastructure because the land use has intensified over time. But I also know Ben's got, I think you said four total. There are four. And so we might want to look at the next yes, one. Yes, we'll go, we'll do those. Hopefully those are real. Uh, I mean, it seems like the key for this one, though, is like versus just blanket. We're going to make this percent across the whole city for this type of land use. We really need to think about that type of land use in that part. Of the city. Yeah, yeah. And, and it doesn't need yeah. exactly that, that table. Um, it's more of a let's revisit what what this what the case study found was our design criteria underestimates. Uh -huh. well, they said we need to adjust. And, and their table was just, we don't know what to do, you tell us what number to use. Um, Which everyone else is doing, because it's like it's not clear. Right, so. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, <clears throat> so the second recommendation, then, this came from zoning, uh, from talking with Stephen Murray. Do they need to just, at the very least, um, define what impervious cover is? And then do they need to incorporate that as some other cities do into the lot coverage um, within you know each zoning type? So do they do they rather than say uh, lot coverage and then kind of separate it out to things, you know, sheds and arbors and uncovered patio versus covered patio, do they just say the intent of this is this maximum impervious cover? Is someone gonna come back and build a pool? Was there? Not everyone, but right. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the intended maximum impervious cover, and it's typically associated with parking areas and so. So it's like I guess the so in talking with uh, Stephen, the the idea would be the recommendation would be for them to get permission to go look at this. Um, you know, get get the green light from Dana to go even just see what would or wouldn't change. It, would, it wouldn't be, we're not recommending that they do anything, but <clears throat> I think what we found is there is a disconnect with zoning and stormwater, and possibly there are zoning cases that come in and the zoning, you know. The zoning they, uses lot coverage versus stormwater uses a perfect coverage. Right, and, and when they're doing zoning and talking with them, they don't even think about stormwater at all it's like not even in the conversation it's not something they're just thinking density and elevation and, you know, that, that thing. so so at the very least would it be something they consider when they're talking about that point in some cases the city's incentivizing pushing for additional density yes especially in our core yes seems to be without trying. having the conversation so so as they're doing that at least thinking about, hey, maybe we ought to, you know, talk with stormwater because we've got this impervious cover thing in our uh, ordinance now. <clears throat> you know, should we should we go more dense? Should we, you know, what should we do? And that's not, you know, something that we're going to. So you're talking about development areas, areas, areas for. I think I think it would be every everywhere mm -hmm. just to. <clears throat> but the I mean, they could have an issue. With Right, right. So, so they could only maybe say, "Hey, we don't care about these other, a, you know, zoning." But if you do have your whatever prior criteria flows out of this process, then they get in place, regardless of the zoning allowed. They don't have criteria, right? That they would have to comply with. Them. Yes. So, so the zoning part of this is. Yes. Yeah. So the recommendation is less drainage to the zoning commission. <laughs> You'd be surprised how often it comes up, though. Oh, I know, but I mean, there's no one yeah. ever going to ask about it every single time. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's imagine, imagine, imagine the zoning, imagine the zoning board telling somebody that they couldn't, they couldn't build a pool or a patio in their backyard. Just imagine that conversation, mm -hmm. because that would be the conversation you're going to have. Yep. With a lot of people. That's true. Right. That's true. And so be one that's, that's, that's what we else problem. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so that's the that's the uh, that's the question. Does the zoning more even mess with that? But we would recommend that they at least yeah. look at it and where they go with it is kind of right. up to them. But yeah. we would be happy to work with them as they try and mm -hmm. define that and 
you know, incorporated into the zoning ordinance. Or if you don't want to have that conversation, you increase that 65 to 75 or 80. Developer has to put bigger pipes in the ground. The house costs more, the street costs more. But yeah, 50 more years from now, we're not having the same conversation because new neighborhoods mm -hmm. are flooding. Not everybody wants a pool, and not everybody wants a yes, extra petty. Right. 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 So do you do you take some snapshots and say, okay, the average, you know, two hundred lot phase has a pool, or you know, I don't know. I don't know what that one's I mean, I think you're averaging averages at this point. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> and you don't always have to do a 5,000 square foot lot, and most of them now are 6,200 square feet anyways, and, and the corner lots that don't have that. I mean, it's, yeah. I just, I go back to when I was in engineering school, and, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's conservatism factors of safety in general, and any design criteria you use, but I don't remember any factor of safety saying, you know, let's worry about something that might happen 50 years from now. I mean, I mean you know, there, there's some kind of reasonableness to this is our current standards, this is our current science, and this is what we need to go with. So, I mean, I just, again, like you said, I mean, the, the Linwood area or TCU or some of those places like that, that it's a different picture. And, and even 50 years from now, there's not going to be that kind of driver that far out to necessarily have everybody be that kind of thing because there's not a college up there for people to live next to or it's not close to the central business district or something we will continue to grow and intensify that's just kind of natural but you know you're you the Fort Worth has some really kind of unique like yeah. and, and not that other cities don't but it's all it's it's you know it's transit oriented or it's college oriented or it's entertainment district or there are places like that that go on a bunch of people and those are areas in almost any city you go where they have all that uh, urban redevelopment and densification, and yeah, as part of that, the impervious area just shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But it's not as much ever. You can go find plenty of there. You can drive through Ridgely or someplace like that, and it doesn't look anything like it does at TCU or at London. Well, I'm curious like about that. will like Summerfields or Summer Creek or even future walls, will there always be HOA? Will there always be it's somebody required by the city ordinance? Okay. No, so no. you can draw a line literally probably or everything with an HOA, they drop a hammer on your patio. Right? I mean they literally can. Not yeah. everywhere. Although I live in an HOA and the guy by me just like poured this giant additional driveway so he could park more cars in his yard. I mean it's huge. All right, Joey, I got a letter to that one. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, he did say he got approval from the HOA. Yeah, um, yeah. I think it was a But I mean, it's huge. And design yeah. got on the criteria, yeah. right? But I got a letter saying you have a commission to afford two additional people. But, but if the guy next yeah. to you wanted to add on a bedroom on the back of his house with a, with a and, and rent it out and be able to lock it off and pour parking in his backyard for the tenant that he wants to rent his bedroom out to, your HOA has the ability to. Correct. So I mean, Correct. you know, it's yes. you know, but it, it again, it depends on what your how your HOA jobs are limited, what they right. what they allow and don't allow. Right. But again, that that type of thing you wouldn't expect to see in a subdivision because they're very covered by an HOA. Whereas so many places, like you say, in the city, there's no HOA, there's no control. And one guy can live there for fifty years, and the guy next door puts in a fourplex and rents it out to college students. It sounds like the guidelines are tied to any regulation those areas are concerned. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think that's why it's zoning you know, specific. Some of these overlays, maybe it's maybe it's a uh, overlay has an impervious, you know, whereas the base zoning just sticks with lot coverage. I don't know. In my opinion, you could have said all these dense areas anyways and capture some taxes and pay for stormwater issues. Um, before we move on from this, well, I guess two, two things. One thing that's, that Stephen Murray brought up was that they could look into, but they would also need you know, permission from, from Dana and uh, Council, is could they incentivize people to add some kind of LID feature um, if they're going to give them like an extra floor, vertically, 
if they will add in some sort of LID feature in the parking lot or some green infrastructure component that they can incentivize them. We, I mean, we have should to incentivize green. developers and builders everywhere you can possibly use the word all the time talking about repairing buffers and tree ordinances incentivizes developers to do certain things and get them the extras right if you want to set aside an extra 10 acres of trees incentivize them to get more into so so that was something that he brought up um i kind of lumped it in here with the same you know as, as defining the curvious um and, and again that would be kind of exploratory for them but the recommendation would be Please, please look at this if you're willing, and um, see what see what comes of that. So. I like the idea of incentivizing LID features. I mean, we should all think through that anyways. But this maybe not work out financially today, but eventually it may work out in some of those areas that we need. Great. All right. At the end of the day, we're putting a pencil to everything we do. Yeah. You tell me how those ten acres, I just lost. Yeah. Right. Forty lots, let's say. 40 residential lots, 30 residential lots, some number. If you tell me I want to preserve 10 acres of trees, I can, use, I can put in smaller lots. Maybe not lose any lots, maybe even gain a few lots, but my lots are smaller, so I can't sell them for the same price. But at the end of the day, if it's a net sum zero to me, then you didn't kill my project. It's still, I can still get a bank loan and go get investors and go build the project. You got your 10 acres of trees. You know, it that it, you know the incentivizing actually can make a project work versus not work. You know, to get some of the yeah. things that the city. Well, I mean, they, again, some projects are kind of work. They're so good, they, you know. It'll work. Some projects are really on the edge, and you don't know. So, but that. And I think the idea here was do it. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. But if you do, if you're willing to do this, mm -hmm. then we'll, we'll yeah. work with you and we'll give you. Yeah, I mean, obviously, what so, the benefits are, what the yeah, trade-off yeah. is. And, and, he, he gave a couple of examples, right, and some other stuff I don't know. We might need some guidance on what incentives look like because we, we talk about incentivizing things and it never happens, whether it be water quality, because we incentivize water quality, but no one, no one does it. The stormwater wise, it has not happened yet, but I'll tell you, well, this place it has. So yeah. I'm doing a near south side hotel. We got an extra two stories in height because we're giving an extra three acres or two acres of open space. And maybe it's the two stories that makes a difference because we've got this TC overlay and- Again, it's not, at the end of the day, it's, a, it's about a financial yeah. model that has to work. So it might be that you all can help let us know what at what threshold does it help make it work? It sounds like one story in the TC area hasn't been used yet, so maybe that one story is not sufficient, maybe two stories, three, I don't know what that looks like. It depends on the area and the market and what you, you know I mean? Yeah. Sometimes you can put two more stories, but there's not that much demand. Sure. You know, yeah. man, that horse, you know, I mean, I don't, <laughs> I'm not really big enough to park. You, you, and, 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 and residential versus commercial versus hotels, or, you know, I mean, obviously. Yeah. So every project's going to be different as to what, what it is, but uh, like you're talking about, like the stuff, like the multi family units around TCU and stuff like that. But that's, mm -hmm. Yeah, so we go three stories and you go stick brick, stick and brick, right? But then you have a four story and now you're going to steal the program. What well, changed the whole thing? Right. right. So that one extra is more and expensive then, than it is that. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, that's why you might need two, right? Yeah. Let me go work there. Mm -hmm. All right. We're moving. We're cooking here. We've got 20 minutes. <clears throat> okay. So it's B zone, by the way. B zone. Was it rezoned to B? Or was it zoned originally? I think it was rezoned. So now that's where you guys need to raise your hand and say you're going to have more intense use with way more concrete allowed. And that's where I need to have a conversation with that. And that's where I think by having that impervious in the ordinance will hopefully because it's just there's we don't talk, you know. This yeah. won't be allowed anymore. This wouldn't be allowed any longer with the neutral mark bacteria because you have to do a study. Yeah. Automatically when you do something like this back. Yeah. yeah. But and honestly that might not even been reasonable. There's lots of those parts of the west part of the city that has underlying B zoning. It's, it's A is single family, yeah. and B is duplex. A lot of Arlington Heights and a lot of TC area. They just have B zoning on a lot of single family neighborhoods. And like I say, when somebody tears one down and puts up the duplex, and the neighbor's mad, but it's zoned for duplex. Yeah, so yeah, it's it's zoned. Neighborhood. Is that over the west? What's yeah. over? Is that what it is? Well, they had 85 zone and everything, but they had 10 and 12,000 square foot lots. 
they were tearing down his house and building two houses on on his wheels because they had his own. Yeah, and most of the hills. Yeah, there's a lot of that over there too. But I mean, Arlington Heights, 10, 15 years ago, that was a huge project. Yeah, good point. So similar to this, this is another zoning thing. So Stephen kind of walked me through the history. I can't remember the details, but basically, people were complaining about the neighbor situation that Jennifer brought up, where they're parking all their cars in the front yard, and so they so they went with this fifty percent. And, it, and it's not. I don't think it's straight in the zoning ordinance. I think it's in the subdivision ordinance. But they it was years ago, and they haven't looked at it since. It was just like fifty percent of the driveway cannot be, you know. I think if it's circular, it was 65%. So do we want them to revisit that also just to look at, do they just say entire lot for, for residential? Do to be allowed to be Could you even enforce that is the question, right? I don't think so. The bottom line here is going to be, does the infrastructure support the use you're putting in the area, right? And that goes for traffic, and parking, and stormwater. If you don't have the infrastructure, you can't build what you're building. That's a problem. I and mean, we told that to people over in the Montgomery class and stuff. They wanted to go from commercial to to four-story apartment complexes everywhere. And the real estate council wouldn't get involved because if the infrastructure supports it, we're not here to say one project is better than the other. So if you have parking, if you have roadways for extra cars that to come based on this. Um, if you have stormwater, then then it becomes a land use conversation. That's discretionary upon our yeah. and council. Yeah. And that makes sense to me. I mean, you know, drive down Carroll Street and I see all that construction going on. It's like, good lord, we got flooding problems, issues as it is, and they're just more and more ads building up, and it's like right on the road practically, not the street there, Carroll Street. Yeah. Um, um, so in this case, I would have said, if this came out today, it would be no, you can't do this because you don't have the infrastructure. This area floods, right? You can't. But that's yeah, probably one built as a project, right? Right. No, no, that's that's probably built one at a time. That's right? exactly the problem. You know, if I came in as a developer and said, hey, I got this couple blocks in their TCU and I'm going to demolish all the existing houses and come in with a new project, you know. I'd be looking at, you know, if I just demolish houses and could build new houses on the same thing, I could just come in and replant and do it. But if that was just a piece of property in down by TCU right. and I had to plat it and everything, then I'd have to come in and analyze stormwater, put in detention, and mm -hmm. it would have some up to date, at least, stormwater protections that you can't uh, require somebody in a platted lot that just wants a new building permit. To comply with that. So, so this is cumulative stormwater. So, so yeah, this brings us to our last, <laughs> our last one, which is, okay, let's say, let's say we're talking about these guys. Let's say there's a city flood risk area that looks like this orange area, flood zone. Um, but that flood zone isn't on any of these lots. It's, it's, you know, behind. You know, over on Lubbock, and then and it kind of floods the houses over to the west or, or somewhere downstream, right? So let's say we know these guys are contributing to that, that the stormwater infrastructure does not support that because they came in one at a time under one acre, they don't need to do any kind of study. So very soon, the city flood risk area will be uh, roll out and but if you're not in that mapped area, you would not be affected. So it's not the watershed, it's just the inundation limits, the flooding limits. So it's more of a, hey, if you're going to be right here, you should elevate, or you know, maybe don't. If you're going to build a, a giant retaining wall right here, it's going to flood your neighbor. It's a conveyance thing right now. Right, there's there's water that's going to come down the street or between these houses or something. So we need you to address that if you're going to build there. At the very least, you need to build up and you're going to have an engineer help you. He's going to sign a certificate of compliance, whatever that is, whatever that looks like. So 
would we, let's say that rolls out and everything's about a hitch, smooth, smooth sailing, and we're able to review it. Would we be, would this group be interested in expanding that to the areas that are contributing to that flooding? So it's an area that's under one acre. It's not getting looked at. There's no drainage study because, but but everyone upstream of that flood zone is doing impervious cover. Um, would would we be interested? So so you see that little circle. You might not be able to see it. That would be this lot right here as a, as an example. So and those are residential, so it's not a great example. But I just found something that had a vacant lot next to but not inside of a city flood risk area you know inundation zone um, that guy is going to develop right next to a flood hazard area and make it worse by paving the entire thing and how much worse is he going to make it probably not very much but everybody else doing the same thing cumulatively it is going to make a difference right mm -hmm. So would we be interested at some point in pursuing expanding the known, not, not Greenfield, not anywhere else, but would we be interested in, in looking at a, a volume? So it would I think strictly pretty much be a volume, how much volume you're generating, how much is permissible. So I think there's no way around some sort of micro detention low impact development, green infrastructure type BMP, uh, you know, best management practice device or something to to limit or capture some of that volume. That's I, I don't see a way around that. So maybe another way to say that is the watersheds where we have a city flood risk area and where we know the infrastructure is on the size. This would be a way of identifying the watersheds where some sort of cumulative impacts regulation has the most benefit, the most impact. Right, right. It's it's only known flood risk areas where we know that cumulatively it would be getting worse. But it is a that's, that's a uh, who's going to go on that lot knowing that's the requirement and knowing that nobody else on the block had to do it. So those other houses on the previous slide are just upstream of TCU that goes down sandage mm -hmm. and cart all those the TCU housing flooded and you know it washes cars down alleys across Berry Street. This is the upstream part of that watershed. And none of this is actually in a mapped city flooding area. Yeah. So but they're contributing to it obviously. So what what's what so what about the city of Dallas? So what I've seen, I haven't seen very many. And the ones not I many have, have a flood risk area. First not many have a flood risk area. So ours is unique in that it is, it is. Um, we're identifying where the actual water is, and so we're regulating where the water is going to be. And it's like, a, we want to communicate that to people before they go build something that's going to flood. That's like the biggest thing. And then help them not flood the neighbors or themselves. So at the very least elevate. Um, but you know, are you diverting water? So that's so that's like a totally separate question, right? The city flooders area. The the volume is what we're talking about here is the contributing who's contributing that water before it gets to the part where it floods. Sure. Would we be willing? I mean, so so here's the here's the thing. We've got clay soils. They don't infiltrate. You would have to use some sort of synthetic, you know, either either dedicate some portion like micro detention, actually capture some of that, or yeah, you know, we're talking rain barrels. We're talking. You know, I know Dallas did a study for rain barrels that Dr. Uh, Flaw did. Where they're talking about that, implementing that type of stuff. You'd have to do like some kind of, you know, vegetative swale, 
something where you're losing a piece of it and it's something that most likely is going to have to be maintained. So, did they find the rainwater harvesting was effective? Or? Well, their, their study was like, hey, if everyone in this whole watershed did it, it would be reduced by, you know, 15 to 20 percent runoff or something. It was, it was a large number, but it was like everybody. So they, I think they're trying to do some like voluntary, you know, we'll buy your rain barrel, <coughs> you come pick it up and promise to do it type thing. Instead. So what, do you, what are your thoughts? This one's like, what do you do? Is it is it just financially killing any project that tries to develop there? Does it work? What, what are your thoughts? It seems like if there's an area that is contributing to an issue that, that and the issue then happens downstream, that it makes sense that you might want to try to manage the problem, the issue where it occurs, right? Or at least that's fair, right? And so that would suggest, if I understand correctly, yes, let's let's try to, I don't hesitate to use the word regulate, but manage it or address it where it occurs at the source. Now, how we do that, is it practical? I don't know, but yes. And, and in a way that is not a lot, un, too much unlike the valley storage thing, what we were saying there is, if I fill an area, then I need to keep zero, make a compensatory uh, cut on the other bank, so that I'm, I'm neutral, so that I don't increase runoff 10 miles downstream in the next city. That's what we said there. We addressed it right where the problem was. So in that sense, let's, yes, let's address it where the source is. So what, before coming to the city as a consultant, I did some jobs for, uh, for the federal government, and they've got this, I think I mentioned this before, but they're, they're wanting all these new federal facilities to capture the 95th percentile, so it's usually about an inch or so of rain on site through green roof, micro retention, bow swell, bow retention, something on site before it leaves. That's kind of their directive. I think that started with Obama. I don't know how well it's. This was for a couple of VA projects that were on that we that we did that. Uh, where to the to the uh, Extent technically feasible was the kind of out there that you have that didn't work. But this is a tiny little site, you know, it's one under one acre. What can you possibly fit on there? And then what are you going to do? How much, you know, is it worth looking into? Do we want to recommend like further well, investigating it? And, and maybe like, like quite that. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. Well, I was going to say maybe the solution isn't micro. In the area where the problem, where the source is, maybe it's a little bit broader, like the whole area in general. How do we address the issue at the source in that general area, whatever you called it, where the flooding, the flood mm -hmm. area was, so that it doesn't just transfer the entire problem downstream somewhere else? And so maybe it's not rain barrels; it's something bigger, a little bit more macro scale that a city government has to do, right? Not an individual. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Man. No, that's fine. Uh, I was if you have some type of at the end of the day some type of uh, impervious cover guideline or regulation or whatever, then I, I would suggest in a case like this that if I'm going to come in and build a house there and I comply with the impervious cover regulation, then I shouldn't have to do anything in in addition, mm -hmm. right? But if I want to come in there and paint the whole damn thing, you know and put four people on the house and everything else and I do exceed it, then yes, then I should have to do something to offset that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. so that yeah. would yeah. lend itself to that max maximum impervious language, because yeah. how else would you regulate that they don't at all right now? I don't know how she did it, that a maximum amount of parking places on that yeah. property. Max parking places, maybe. That's that the only way. other across the street there, you see the guy can paint his entire yeah, backyard. Yeah, he sure did. Yeah. <laughs> he sure did. Yeah. <laughs> That's not allowed. That's not allowed. Yes, you can do. And, and, you know, historically, the cities want, we want more parking spaces, you know. Now, you've got to have two garage spaces and two driveway spaces, you know. The city wants all that parking off the street and on the lot, you know. But, but you can't have five, you know. You know, I mean, but, but there's got to be some kind of 
Oh, yeah, like reverse the reverse curve of the flexibility, right? And right, I, right. But I would think that would be a fair. So how does this meet the, the 20 foot? Is that not applicable here? The way the, this this whole driveway is the whole front yard. Right? I would imagine. That's what you were pointing. Yeah, well, yeah. Some sort of business that came in and got it. Yeah. But I mean, this park is in the right place. It's in front of the building line, behind the property line. Yeah. <laughs> it's got all this headed parking right where it belongs. It's just got a place for eight of them instead of two. Camper and whatever. Yeah. So what if you had something like? I mean, the problem would be the maintenance, but some kind of you know, impervious or pervy, permeable pavement or pavers or something like that. So you're yeah. allowing the parking, but you're allowing more infiltration to go with it. So, so that is an option. I think with options like that, the the trick is maintenance always. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the. And you know, if you did something like that, would you need a sweat mop? The you know, some kind of storm mop facility maintenance agreement to where they. On my honor, I will vacuum these pervious pavement yeah. holes out That's not gonna twice a year. Or to make sure that the next property owner that moves in there knows, oh, you can't go and change it all the time. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. Do we do? Do we want to look into that? Yeah, I'm going to go to this. I feel, I'm kind of, I feel bad about taking away the rights of a property owner mm -hmm. that already has the right to build perfect zoning allowed today. Mm -hmm. If you're going to go above and beyond that, then maybe there's some way to put in place. And that's the thing number two, because right now the zoning and the, the right is to pay your entire backyard. Right. So, so yeah, that's what mm -hmm. just keeps leading me back to putting in the zoning rather than us trying to, you know, look at every permit. Right. 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 Okay. All right. I'm going to go. We got. That's a pretty interesting question, though. Mm -hmm. It is, and, and I don't know that anybody has the answer. And, you know, you've got you got like more ones. Not, not all stuff. easy answers. Certainly. They're definitely not easy answers, and these are things that we're going to definitely you know keep looking into and revisiting. So I guess here's all four. Number one, we we had some. Uh, are we? Do we want to recommend looking into updating? The uh, stormwater criteria manual to close to closer match what's out there. Using the study, not not copy and paste what was in that case study, that table, but using that as a you know, hey, this identified and, and we can revisit that with development services with the arms group and stormwater folks. Is that something we would like to recommend? Revising. The impervious areas to match the actual zone and maybe capture some that aren't captured or clarified. Well, I'm embarrassing. So I just want to say we should come back to that one because there were some minor edits in the manual that back seen two or three times already, which marginally expanded or clarified. Okay. And so I think. I think we should say, do we want to do more of that? But there were some edits that I feel like maybe clarified a little bit. Okay. So plus, you think maybe we already addressed that? Plus, not like quite. Be able to, but some not paint the entire city with these rules, and maybe there's some way you can actually calculate your size, your site, that I can use the real number. Right. Yeah. So I'm not using 95% impervious, right? If I do long calculation, it's only 9%. And that's where that industrial commercial cycle right. comes in. Mm -hmm. You pick your law percentage based on what you're actually doing. Right. So there's flexibility. Yeah, well, not, I guess some of these industrial sites are just you know, small building, small building, small building with you know, these little grass roads and dirt roads. And mm -hmm. It's not the same as putting a nine square foot industrial complex out there. So, so I think what you're saying, Stephen, is this would be more of a continue to refine, yeah, mm -hmm. because it's already yeah. kind of like started to happen with the most. Mm -hmm. We were talking about this morning, and, and Mike and he said he remember if, uh, if this next update had had the vision set. There was some minor edits in there to just yeah. clarify because there was there was one off the Marine Creek Parkway where they had R one 
and the site plans aren't system center focus. They are not system focus. That was a couple of years ago. So I think we just, we just broke that into a couple more categories. Okay. So it's actually specific to our zoning rules. So I guess the recommendation, yeah, would be to further keep keep updated as needed. Mm -hmm. I think it's good feedback. But as, as we do look at that, make sure it's focused okay. and not. Okay. Yes, like where it makes sense to do it, not just no. like saying everything. Yeah. But it makes sense. You want it to be accurate for the area. The concept. Right. But one size doesn't fit all, is what we're yeah. doing. Right. And yeah. perhaps that's the, my suggestion is yeah. let, if you're going to do it, let's do it where you have a problem in most respect. Let's do it inside the loop or, or whatever the appropriate delineate and see how right. it works. Right. You yeah. know, before we yeah. you know, just and expand everything. The SDS is, keeps um, getting the same. But I do. Yeah, they okay. need to do something. Okay. That's a, an appropriate so we'll, we'll kind of, I think we'll sort of tweak that to be. Hopefully, Juliana said some great notes here. Hopefully, we'll 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 tweak that to be you know, continue revising as as needed, as necessary, and as we see. Because uh, again, you go back to like we we do a whole drainage study for any new subdivision, right? There's sub subdivision upstream and developed, there's subdivision downstream and developed. They've all done everything. Everybody's done for structure. For, for structure is design. Sorry. Now you change the C values. So guess what? Nobody storm drainage works under your new study because they're all undersized because, you know. Right. It's not, or you, it, it, that's little, you know, I mean, so now you're okay. Well, see a big rainfall now, a big rainfall, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's coming to you. So, yeah. Okay. So, but I think that's, you know, you're right. going to have to deal with it whether you're inside the loop or outside that everything else is done on that criteria, but. Okay. So it sounds like number, number one's a yes, um, kind of with, with the revision. Number two, it sounds like everyone's okay with us proceeding, but that probably is going to be the most effective, actually. I think that's essential. I think it's kind of ridiculous that a city could run with like a zone, a council or a zoning committee that doesn't have the same definitions as other departments and and they can work mm -hmm. against each other. And I think they do. And in, today. in Fort Worth's defense, this is every city. <laughs> every city. Every, every, every city. I said, they, I said they they said, yeah. Yeah. Right every city. Every city. Every city. Every city. It's not just Fort Worth. I mean, I this, is, this is typical. I'll just this say is every, This is the way they, they came from different places. You know, well, they came from engineering and everyone came from zoning and land use. And, and everyone means well. And I've seen yeah. some of the folks come for a zoning committee, they want to open an accounting office and the zoning committee says, well, you only have six parking spots. If you put eight and a half, we'll let you do it. Right. And so they want to pay more stuff to get them to get everything approved, or they just made more impervious ground yeah. So, And that's what they do in zoning, is just follow the rules they have. Right. So right. having good definitions that we all understand, it's going you know, to so so the planners and engineers don't like talking to planners. <laughs> 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 They use big words, we don't like yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I think number three goes hand in hand with number two. It would be along with that, you know, let's let's look at maybe it's maybe it's parking, maybe it's full lot coverage, whatever it is, include the whole lot <coughs> just in the front yard. Let's whether it gets followed or not, I think is a whole other thing, but it's in the zoning ordinance and, and hopefully Catches. But you might have to look at what is the number. Yes. Like you have 50% on this example here. That's actually, that's I actually no idea if that's a good number or not. Just, yeah, right, right. That's a lot of space if right. you apply it to an entire lot. That's a great point. So that so the recommendation would be let's give zoning. Our recommendation to council would be mm -hmm. give zoning permission to revisit this. Right. They can get stormwater input. Um, as they as they look at that, but it was something that was thrown in based on a bunch of complaints about parking, and it had nothing to do with stormwater whatsoever. But we'd like to sort of hey, let's, let's yeah. collaborate here. Number of bedrooms with this bike we had ten years ago. Okay. It was <laughs> two cars in the garage, two cars in the driveway, four cars. But anything over four bedrooms, you have another parking space behind the driveway. Okay. Well, yeah. Wow. Um, okay, last but not least, number four. So the first three, I think, are yeses with with the first one being revised a bit. 
the language. Number four, did we come to, did we come to a consensus on that? Do you want to? These four prone areas, is this the 17 you said last meeting? Yeah. There's 17 designated yeah. risk blood areas. So yeah. that's the areas we're talking about. That's the areas we're talking about. So we're talking yeah. about, so, make sure. so you see that, I shouldn't have used orange, but it was just what I had in GIS. The, the orange kind of circle around yeah. the flood area, that is the watershed that drains to that flooded area. But the people getting flooded are the people in the shade at the very in the yeah. shaded area. Yeah. So, so all the people upstream there, yeah. can, as long as they're keeping it within an anchor, they can do whatever they want, impervious wise, and not not have to. It's like I don't, you know, I don't need to worry about those people. But I, I kind of thinking back now on our conversation, we said that. We're hoping, I mean, maybe maybe keep this in the back pocket and hope that the, or we feel that the zoning is a better. I think we have the right to develop your property per the zoning. So if you fix some zoning stuff, then you should have the right to develop your property per the zoning. If you're going to go above and beyond that, add extra parking spaces, put in, you know, more than wall floors, you may allow that one day in the backyard, then you should have to mitigate for that. Okay. Yeah. Any, any other thoughts? So I would say that makes number four a no based on, you know, improving numbers two and three. Number, yeah, it, that should help address number, number, four. number four. Without, without, you, imposing without having a separate thing, if, right. you know, and if, okay. you know, like I say, you want to put all this stuff in, then you have some kind of local attention. All right. Any, any other? So qualified no. <laughs> any other comments on it? Qualified no. I, I don't remember which this was. I think it was Alan. I think another city stormwater told me this, but uh, I think it was the city of Alan. They look at development in terms of the watershed and they model it as if the, as if the watershed was fully developed, mi mirroring what the future land use mass looks like. So then you can adjust the infrastructure, look at infrastructure instead of piecemeal. You're looking at it holistically mm -hmm. as things move and you're saying, okay, well, this is what's going to be 20 years from now. Based off our assumptions. Yeah. yeah. So we, we, we do that here. They assume no backyard stuff. They assume a driveway, a house covered minus <coughs> 50%. That's um, it. That's it. They don't assume all the extra stuff. They just put on there after years and years. So they're mm -hmm. in that in that way, they're like us. Uh, we do assume fully developed land use conditions. Um, unfortunately, in these 17 areas, it's all you're at, you know. You're, you're adding one more bucket to yeah. the pool of already flooded pool. So I think we decided on a one foot buffer for repairing something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bunch of all right. So, I want to get get you all out of here. Next steps. I'm, I'm no. We're going to draft a memo, kind of summarizing our discussions and these four recommendations. Well, for impervious plus the uh, valley storage and continue to go through interdepartmental DAC and you know, report to MITC. Um, can you give me this presentation so I can take it to the city council one more? Sure. Sure. Um, and then from there, any any ordinances? We'll just keep working with everybody. So. We had told council we'll be giving them an update by the end of the year. And Jennifer uh, wanted me to make sure that I keep you all updated on what that recommendation, you know, as we give that final recommendation after we go through some revisions and more conversations or whatever we end up recommending would be uh, communicated to this original group. So I'll continue to stay informed. Okay. But um, thank you all so much. Any last final questions before we? I know more input is going to be coming from several of you guys. Um, I would just say, as input comes in from whether it's DAC, Real Estate Council, or the association, if you could just update the committee with those comments so we can all be briefed on okay. concerns or questions about you. Sure. We can do that. Great. Mm -hmm. Any final words? So good, right? Thank you all for coming. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, so, well, yeah, it really does. Um, I, 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.